And thank you very much, uh, all of you, for uh, attending this session. As you can imagine, uh, we're very proud to be associated with Scientific African. I would like to start by congratulating the African Institute of Mathematical Sciences and the Next Einstein Forum on the launch of Scientific African. I'd also like to congratulate both organizations on what seems to me to be an absolutely amazing event. Uh, I listened to the speakers this morning and was inspired by what they were saying. And it made me proud to be associated with such a powerful, impactful initiative, not just on behalf of Elsevier, but also personally. And on the personal front, I'm particularly attracted by the work of the Next Einstein Forum because I started my working life in Africa, in West Africa, working for five years in the two Congos and in Angola. And while I was there, I saw at first hand how education, training, and local initiatives can transform the prospects for an individual, for families, and for whole communities. And I was hugely encouraged by this morning's repeated messages that link science to well-being and to economic prosperity. I believe that's why, in answer to the question from the opening session, we are here. But that experience was a long time ago. Let me give you a more recent example. Working together with a group called AMREF, we at Elsevier have been helping young entrepreneurs in Africa. A young student in Kenya a few years ago found himself in desperate need of the emergency services. But he found it very difficult to reach them. And once he'd recovered from his, uh, his event, he spent the next couple of years building a mobile application that would more easily connect people who had the same need for immediate access to emergency services to those uh, assistance that they needed so desperately and so immediately. The organization is called Usalama, and together with AMREF, we have been giving funding to this absolutely valuable initiative, which fits, I think, exactly with the, uh, the president's statement this morning that the best initiatives are local initiatives, are local initiatives which understand the local environment. But let's then move from the individual level to the macro level. What about research in general in Africa today? Thierry mentioned a couple of statistics uh, about publication output in Africa. And on one level, the picture is encouraging. Output is growing steadily at about 10% per year in terms of publication output and the number of authors and number of researchers, which compares very favorably with the world average of about 3 to 4%. In addition, the quality of output is also rising steadily and is now, across the whole of Africa, very close to the world average, with a few notable countries which stand significantly ahead of the world average. And I'll just point out uh, a couple of them. Here in Rwanda is one of them. Mozambique is a second. Zambia is a third. But there are many others that sit above the world average or very, very close to it. But there's much, much more to do. Thierry pointed out that there is a lack of proportionality between the size of the population in Africa compared to the whole of the world and its research output. And even a doubling of that output would still leave Africa slightly short of being proportionate. So there's a lot of ground yet to cover. Visibility of African research, training of African researchers, research institutions, and policymakers and understanding of the local element all need attention if Africa is to reach its full potential. So we think about how we at Elsevier can help. Well, here's a couple of ways in which we think we can do that. First of all, by virtue of our position as being a global provider of research information and analytics, we have quite a unique perspective on the global research landscape. As a result of that, we can show what other countries are doing. We can show what individual institutions are doing 
around the world. We can even go down to individual disciplines in individual institutions in individual countries. Now, that can be very useful as policymakers and the heads of institutions are thinking about whom to collaborate with, whether they are top of the field, what their ambitions should be if they want to reach the top of the field. What can they learn from the groundbreakers or the, the top uh, institutions or the top researchers? And we can provide these types of information in ways in which research policymakers, heads of institutions, can easily digest the data and make actionable decisions. Even individual researchers, when given access to these data, can look for collaborators, can look for fields of research to enter, can even look for funding. And this then adds to the uh, support to the researchers around understanding the research infrastructure, understanding how to navigate the world of research, and understand how to get access to funds. We do other things. We can help early career researchers with training to help them navigate. We offer training to early career researchers in developing countries as to how to make a publication work how to write the publication in ways that it's more likely to be accepted quickly in the best, most appropriate journal. We help them to think through how to choose the most appropriate journal. We offer training to institutions, to librarians, as to how to curate a body of research information which is tailored, customized, and relevant to that particular institution without adding resource which may not be used very often. We offer grants for researchers to travel, and we particularly offer grants to women in their early careers to help them break free of what infrastructure or environmental circumstances may be holding them back from reaching their full potential. We offer the majority of our research content for free to around 100 developing countries around the world through the program Research for Life. And a very specific example, during the Ebola crisis a couple of years ago, our publication, The Lancet, opened an Ebola resource center where we, where we were able to showcase the entirety of current Ebola research so that anybody around the world for free could come and see what was happening and make educated decisions about what they wanted to do. So those are some examples of how we think we can help in the specific context of developing science, technology, and innovation in Africa. But alongside all of this, in general, we believe we are in the forefront of the digitalization of science and science information, helping scientists better find the information they need and better manage the information they already have. And the way we look at it, these are two of the biggest problems facing researchers anywhere in the world today. And those problems will only grow as the volumes of research information and the volumes of digitized experimental data continue to explode. It is through the application of today's and future information technologies to the scientific resources that you hold, the scientific content that we hold, that we can make the biggest contribution globally to the world of research. We would like to applaud and support Ames and NEF in its open science initiatives, and that takes me back to where we started, to Scientific African. As Thierry mentioned, a pan-African, open access, flagship scientific journal for African researchers, which will accelerate open science and capacity building across Africa. We are very proud to support it and contribute to helping African scientists build a stronger foundation for innovation in Africa's digital economy. Thank you. Thank you very much. And more to the Scientific and African Journal will be shared during the press conference, which is taking place in MH4. So that's for the media in the room. The press conference on the journal will take place in MH4. The next item on the agenda today is about the digital economy. So the next plenary discussion is on driving innovation through Africa's digital economy.
We recognize that the digital economy is indeed the single most important driver of innovation, competitiveness, and growth, and it's hold, it holds a huge potential for African entrepreneurs, small and mid-sized mid enterprises. To talk about this very specific important point, I would like to welcome the moderator for the next session, Mr. Yinka Adegoke, Quartz Africa editor. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you all for being here for uh, our panel. I'm going to invite um, our panelists uh, up. Uh, Mr. Lutz Ziab. Dean of the For Africa Academy at Microsoft, um, Professor Aminata Garba, a NEF Fellow and Director of Kigali Collaborative Research Center, <laughs> Mr. Steve Mutabazi, Chief Investment Strategist with Rwanda's Development Board. Dr. Josh Game, CTO for Johnson & Johnson Family of Consumer Companies. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Solomon Asefa, Director of IBM Research Africa. Is he here? Oh, there. Just walking in. <laughs> uh, thank you all for being here. Um, I was very excited about this panel because um, everyone here has immense um, experience and insights um, that we can all uh, learn from, particularly when we uh, think about uh, a digital economy and um, its impact uh, on Africa. At Quartz Africa, we are a digital pu publication that focuses a lot on innovation and its impact on development, its impact on uh, business and entrepreneurs, and um, the even in, in the three years since I've been doing this, um, the transformation and the impact of digital technologies, um, be it everything from obviously mobile phones through to um, just online uh, presence in general, has, be, has, been, has been fascinating to watch. So one of the things that typically happens at, 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 on panels like this is we sometimes find ourselves uh, dis having a discussion where we have slightly different uh, definitions of terms. So I, I want to get everyone to just give a really short um, definition of what they see as the digital economy. Let's start with you, Lutz. Sure. Starting with an easy question. Good afternoon. I think for me the digital economy is really a creative economy. Look, we've seen transformation and change in, in the industry through innovation um, ever since the Industrial Revolution. Think about gas and steam and the phone, the internet and planes or whatever. What's really new now is the pace of, of development. Just in your mind, list the names of companies that come to mind when you think about digital transformation, both in Africa and globally, and try to remember whether they existed 15, 20 years ago. The answer typically is no. So the pace of change has changed, as well as the breadth of change. There's literally no part of how we live, work, learn, that it remains unchanged. And what's really liberating is the new raw material of the, of the time that we live in is not the raw material we find in our earth anymore. It is in our heads. Ideas, data, imagination, creativity is driving it. So for me, the digital economy is a creative economy. Excellent. Professor Gob? Um, so I think for me, uh, a digital economy is when you integrate information and communication technologies with all other business activities, such as healthcare, uh, education, right. um, uh, economy, financing, uh, agriculture, etc. So you have ICT, which is information and communication technology in the middle, and using this in, the orders, in order to create new applications which are relevant for the right. population. Right. So I, I would like to give an example here. Uh, I guess a lot of you are aware of one laptop per kid. 
Uh, this is an initiative using ICT in education in order to improve the learning of kids. And this was an idea which was proposed around 2005, 2006, mm -hmm. and it was generated from MIT. And the laptop were really very cheap, around $100, and mm. kids will have access to ICT tool and be able to actually learn from it. Um, so what happened is after this idea was developed, the two, the actually the, uh, the laptop were distributed to kids, and after a few years, it was considered to be a failure. Mm. And the question is, why is this a failure? Having cheap laptop for kids in education is supposed to be a good thing to improve the learning, but it didn't work out. So the reason why, uh, some of the reasons why it didn't work out was that the context awareness. These laptops, once the kids have them, what happens when the battery doesn't have energy and then you don't have power at home? So this is one issue. The second issue is also capacity building. What if the teachers don't know how to use the laptop? So even if the kids have the laptops and the, users don't, the, the teachers don't know how to use the laptops, then it wouldn't work. Okay. Um, so capacity building. The other issue which happens is the policy themselves. So the policy is created in the country. So I would like to quickly summarize and say, for me, a digital economy is an economy where they use information and communication technologies to add value to what exists, but right. by taking into account the context they're creating those applications for, and also by making sure that there is capacity building. So it has also to be done in parallel with education. That's, that's particularly important in the context of Africa. And I, and I Absolutely. Let, let me take it to uh, Mr. Steve of the uh, Rwanda Development Board. I am curious how this works into your thinking, because clearly you're thinking about this in the context of you know, government and, and policy making. You know, you're, you're, that, that's kind of behind your investment thinking, so how, how, how do you think about this, the digital economy? Uh, <clears throat> thank you. I, look, I cheated. <clears throat> I decided to ask two, two students, one in grade seven and one in grade eight. Uh, those of you who've been to our, our pavilion just outside there, you'll what, see what, them. What ages are those? Question. Sorry? What ages are those? <laughs> I didn't actually ask the age, but grade seven would be about 11. Okay. The other one is 12. So I'm confessing I did cheat because <laughs> I could have given my own answer, but let me give you their answer. I asked them to imagine what Rwanda would be like in 2050. Mm. <clears throat> and they both responded that it would be a highly digi digitized economy. And I said, what do you mean by that? One of them responded and said, well, for instance, at school, <clears throat> we may not have to worry about books because everything we need will be in, on a digital uh, storage device. Mm. And the other one said, well, <clears throat> you know how we spend a lot of time carrying money around? Okay. We won't need to. I didn't prime them. I simply asked them the questions. That's how they responded. Right. This was under the theme of <clears throat> imagining as an innovator, you have to imagine beyond the horizon. So those were the two answers they gave me in that session. Right. Now, I could give you my own answers, but I respect those you, two young you, you think that, people. Do you, but do you, I, you think that vision captures what you're trying I think to, so. to, I think to so. achieve? Essentially, what they were saying to me was that in that digital economy, mm. there will be so much efficiency. We'll probably think differently. We'll behave differently. We'll act differently in the normal transactions of every day. One used the, uh, the example of a school, the other one used the example of the financial system, the banking and the way we handle money to buy things. So for me, uh, a digital economy, and I agree with the first speaker, uh, is based on innovation. Mm. It's where everybody imagines beyond the ordinary, right? Uh, it's not so much about technology, but it's about how you use technology. And that's, that level of innovation is, I suppose, I could call it socio-economic innovation. So a digital economy 
has that layer, <clears throat> that software, if you want to call it, um, other, as opposed to just thinking about it in terms of technology. Right, right. It's a much more sophisticated way of looking at yourselves as a society. L let me get the, 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 the more corporate view. Um, Josh, could you comment on, on what it means for you from, from the blue chip uh, perspective? Yeah, no, I think um, the starting point is exactly what everybody highlighted in terms of uh, what's going on with digital transformation and how economies are, are continuing to change. We've seen this in China. We're starting to see it in a lot of other places. The core of it is getting information to the right people anytime you want. So this concept of being able to personalize any information because of the digital transformation we're seeing is, is a critical part. For us in healthcare, imagine today when people need information about healthcare, it's almost impossible to get that information unless you live in the urban bigger cities. But through mobile devices, through all the kinds of technologies that we're seeing, I can get any information to anyone anywhere in the world. And that's gonna be an important part of how economies continue to change because they, people can get the information they need, they can get whatever products that they need wherever they live, and I think that's, that's what's changing a lot of the systems that we're seeing. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Asifa. Well, so I'm not very good with uh, definitions. I was about to take out my phone and look it up on Wiki <laughs> Wikipedia, but my phone is dead. So this is all that I could come you, up you with. You probably I mean, find a thousand different <laughs> definitions. Everyone's so, got their own. <laughs> so, I mean, for me, at a higher level, when I think about the digital economy, it's really about how you can leverage digital tools and services so that you can have more efficiency and less friction. Mm. Uh, for example, in terms of how you can actually come up with an idea, incubate an idea, and scale it in a massive, massive way, right? Or how you can actually deliver services, once again, in a very efficient and frictionless manner. How you can do skills training in a massive way. And you're doing all of that using these digital tools and services so that you can be more productive, and in the end, uh, more or less, you know, you are able to leverage these digital tools and services and platforms to reimagine how you deliver services or to imagine how you, you know, approach different industries. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, I know um, that IBM in particular has been doing some very interesting work uh, in terms of uh, blockchain and decentralized uh, networks. Yes. How, I, I'm interested in just hearing the sort of the broad, as you say, uh, 30,000 feet sort of view of how you think um, these sort of de decentralized networks can have a real impact on, on African economies. Yeah, I think they will have a lot, of, uh, a lot of impact and they're very, very interesting. And uh, perhaps, you know, when thinking about those topics, I, I usually think about three specific uh, areas. One is obviously cloud and what yeah. it means for the African economy or the African digital economy. And the other is blockchain. And the other is, of course, you cannot ignore innovation hubs or maker spaces. If you start with the cloud, I mean, I think everybody here knows what a cloud is. It's, you know, being able to get infrastructure or software or platform as a service. And that has quite a lot of uh, significance because it means that uh, more or less, I mean, you can start a business on the cloud. If you have an idea, you know, you don't need to buy that much infrastructure. You can just right. start small and scale it out as your business, you know, uh, improves. Uh, so beyond starting a business, it also means that you can actually collaborate across regions. And, and I think that's significant when you think about all the regional integration that's happening at the moment. Right. And even more importantly, even if you do not invent, you know, the latest technologies such as, you know, the advances in, that you see in machine learning, deep learning, and, and AI, or even in quantum computing, it actually means that if it's relevant for you, you can actually access it over the cloud. So that gives you that competitive edge as long as you know what you're trying to solve, right? So, I mean, if you look at some of our grand challenges that we have in healthcare, you can imagine a doctor, for example, uh, taking a picture and uploading it to the cloud so that he can collaborate across with you know, other doctors the world with yeah. many doctors or a healthcare worker that has a question, you know, she's going to community, she can actually, you know, upskill herself or, you know, ask questions, you know, based well, on the cloud. One issue with the cloud, though, is um, that's come up a couple of times is where the servers are located. Um, where, where do you, uh, 
servers located in, on the African continent much, or is it, we, are we just using servers in California or something? How, how does this work? Well, so even you know, on the African continent, I think ultimately we are forming the backbone, mm. the connectivity and the necessary kind of pods or you know, data centers to actually uh, enable the presence of the cloud on the African continent. And yeah. that's actually relevant because there's a lot of data protection laws that are coming you know, on board. So, I mean, I, over time it is growing. Okay. But, you know, depending on the type of business you're, you're running, right? So healthcare is, for example, a very protected kind of area. Uh, for other, you know, businesses, it actually doesn't matter where you are. What you need is, you know, a service that you can consume that helps you scale uh, the business that, that you're, you're, you have. Josh, can you talk a little bit about healthcare and the digital economy? Well, we're, we're, you know, we've seen lots of bits of innovation here and there. Um, very interesting companies, you know, experimenting, sort of startups. I mean, but you're this big multi-billion dollar uh, uh, blue chip company. What role do, do things like artificial intelligence and blockchain, all these things, what role do they have in, in, in healthcare? Especially, right. especially in terms of getting to people who've not been able to uh, access these services in, in the past. Yeah, you know, I think b before I even jump into people having access, just as a starting point, what e-commerce is doing to pretty much the whole trade situation today, uh, ability to use your phone to buy whatever you want mm -hmm. makes a big change. I think we're seeing this, um, I don't know how many people are familiar, uh, what's called single stay in China, uh, which is 11, on November 11th, where they sell oh, everything yeah. online in one day. Yeah. Tmall alone, one e-commerce site sold $25 billion. And we're starting to see that kind of capabilities right here even in Rwanda. This morning I had a meeting with Kasha, which is an e-commerce platform that's actually selling products to, for women's health based here in Rwanda. And what we see is that, especially in Africa where the infrastructure is not fully established, this is an opportunity to bypass where you don't need this major infrastructures as long as you focus on where technology is, ability to bring broadband, internet access becomes very important. But then you move to the healthcare, it's exactly what was being highlighted. As a healthcare company, we're actually the largest user of the cloud. We move most of our data into the cloud. But more importantly, you can continue to personalize medicine in the future. Um, we've already announced an agreement with Google where we're developing robotic surgery. This is, only happens because of the capability to manage data to remotely be able to access surgical tools. There's three billion people in the world that have zero access to surgery. And the idea is that you're not going to train enough surgeons to actually be able to create access to all those people. But technology is enabling for us to remotely do surgery through robotics, through artificial intelligence, and I think we continue to see this. Um, but more importantly also to be able to personalize medicine. I think the whole drug development was, was done through doing large clinical trials, uh, and it works for a certain population, it doesn't work for others. But in this case, the more information you have about that individual, the more you could actually personalize the solutions that you provide for them. But we also have to remember, I think it's going to continue to be important, especially in healthcare, the rules of privacy, making sure that that information is also protected. I personally think that's where blockchain and others are going to be critical because allowing people to safely control their data and share it with their physician or any healthcare worker as they need, but it, that choice becomes theirs. I think we're going to see all of this. It's already transforming pretty much the healthcare system, and I think it's going to continue to accelerate. That, uh, that's really interesting because I'm thinking, let, let me just switch it away from healthcare for a second. I, I want to come back to that. But, um, I, want to, I want to ask about um, the startups that are driving this, this uh, innovation that we're all, you know, on this panel and many people in the audience are excited about because we see the, you know, we can imagine the potential. Um, and, and this is for uh, Mr. Steve uh, Mutabazi from uh, the development board because of your role as overseeing investments. I'm, in, I'm interested in knowing, um, you know, how you, what kind of models, financial models you see that work best uh, 
to implement across Africa? Because clearly we have, as has already been mentioned, has already been mentioned, we have this challenge with uh, the lack of infrastructure, doing some of the things that uh, both gentlemen from IBM and Johnson Johnson have mentioned that they require existing, sometimes require existing infrastructure. Here we're dealing in many countries without that infrastructure to implement these things easily. So how do you think about the financial models that can perhaps succeed, not only succeed in Rwanda, but go beyond uh, your borders? Thank you for the opportunity, but please allow me some time to take a step back and, and perhaps say what I should have said at the beginning. <clears throat> Rwanda decided 20, almost 20 years ago to work towards becoming a knowledge-based economy, which today translates to a digital economy, right? <clears throat> and a lot of things have happened since. Uh, I was going to tell you about the derogatory comments that were made about a little country that was kidding itself about becoming a knowledge-based economy, but the truth is we've made a long way towards becoming one. But today, I can tell you, almost 20 years later, what we're focused on doing after implementing infrastructure, for instance, we, we have the whole country covered by broadband. Uh, as of uh, December 2017, uh, we added f uh, 4G to, to the entire fiber network in the country. So. Anywhere you go in Rwanda, almost anywhere you go in Rwanda, you'll have good 4G broadband coverage. <clears throat> that was basic infrastructure we knew was necessary. But th there, are, there are certain things that we tend to overlook when we talk about things that have technology. A knowledge-based economy, a digital economy, requires the human capital yes. to make it happen. Okay? So, on this journey that we've been doing for the last 20 years, almost 20 years, uh, we, we're still trying to find our way to the open, clearing, cleared area in terms of what we do with our human capital. Because human capital is essential for innovation. We agreed earlier yes. that innovation is the basic, the, the basic, the basic tenet in uh, a digital economy. So when you look at Africa, <clears throat> and ask yourself, excuse me, and ask yourself, do we have the right human capital for it? We heard uh, discussion before about publications, about whatever, whatever. The, the answer is no, we don't. So let me tell you what, we've, what, we, what we decided to do here in Rwanda with the help of our illustrious uh, president. We decided that <clears throat> this country, to be able to take the next step and start building the real digital economy. We had to have a, a sizable mass, if you like, a sizable pool of talent here in Rwanda. So as many Rwandans as we could possibly get, but we also decided that it was in our best interests to actually build it as a Pan-African pool of talent. That's, that started with Carnegie Mellon coming here Carnegie Mellon University, which specializes in ICT, then the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences hosting this event here. That's for the best mathematicians sourced from everywhere in Africa. The International Center for Theoretical Physics, which is also uh, starting here, that's to source as the best brains in science we can get from anywhere in Africa. The University of Rwanda itself has centers of excellence that we, we include in this innovation ecosystem we're building. And they too source their talent from everywhere in Africa. I'll explain why later on. The African Leadership University, which works with universities like um, Stanford uh, and others. I can't remember the one in the UK, but they also work with Harvard but they focus more on producing entrepreneurs, okay? Their MBA is entrepreneurship. So they came here with the help of our president to, to try and strengthen that step forward, to get a critical mass of talent because innovation requires talent, okay? 
part of the agenda, of course, is to solve the problem we don't have in Africa for, 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 for us to become a digital economy. We don't have enough technology, let's face it. So if you don't have enough technology, you have to rely on technology coming from outside, coming into Africa, being domiciled here. That can happen if you don't have the talent. So that's why we connected the two. Then we realized that to, to build the companies you asked me about, mm. you can't do so unless you have the right money, money that is friendly to them. Small companies in the technology space cannot simply go to a bank and borrow money. <clears throat> so we decided to set up the Rwanda Innovation Fund as the anchor um, <clears throat> component in an ecosystem of friendly financing for technology companies. Three components, human capital, which attracts the technology, and once you've got that, innovation starts happening, and that innovation, those innovators need money, so we set up the market for it. So for me, we can talk about what the digital economy is likely to, 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 to do for us, mm. but I'm more concerned about how we get there. Yeah. Right. We get there by building the right human capital, by making sure that we get the right technologies on the continent without waiting for the next 500 years, because technology will come here, because we have a market, and so on and so forth. So I hope I've answered. No, th no that's, that, that's great. I, I'm interested, how, how many years has the Innovation Fund been, been going now? Uh, it, it will close, prob when I say close, please, people in the audience who don't understand that <laughs> jargon, it simply means <clears throat> yeah, you've that, that finished raising money. You've started working. Uh, the closing will be in the next few months. We're in the process. For how, how much? Uh, it's for 100 million. Mm -hmm. The first closing of the fund is 100 million. Uh, of course, the intent is to create a market. So we'll do a second closing and we'll then figure out how to continue the market working thereafter. But you can see how important it is. If yeah. you don't have that money, Forget about getting small companies that would then build the digital economy that we're looking for. And have you started investing in companies or is this? Sorry? Have you started investing in companies or is it in startups? Uh, it's actually. Or is it from after early, you close? No, no, no. The fund starts at uh, early growth stage. In other words, a, a, comp a company that already has a product right. is already starting to sell, to make money, but needs to grow. <clears throat> The logic of it is that if you have, if you, if you cover that part of the financing spectrum, the earlier stages become workable because angel investors come into the seed stage because they can exit into the fund. The government's effort at much earlier stages also become fruitful because there's now a complete road. Government puts money at the very, very early stage. Ah, I see. Grad they graduate into early stage venture capital who come because they have an exit into a growth stage fund. So is this, is this more the kind of, just to throw a figure out there, something like $50,000, $100,000, that kind of amount? That, that no, the Rwanda Innovation Fund, being at growth stage, will start at probably a quarter of a million okay. upwards. Okay. Quarter of a million to about 10 million. All right. So, so anyway, look, I, I don't want to confuse uh, the audience here, but I just want to point out that it's one thing to wish to become a digital economy. Trust me, it's a lot of hard work. Um, <clears throat> when you go out there and look at our, spec, uh, at our pavilion where we're talking about the innovation ecosystem here, <clears throat> you, you see that we're actually working with young people to try and engender that curiosity, that desire to innovate. Uh, please do listen carefully to the young, young uh, students I was talking to uh, two days ago when that film was, was, uh, was shot. It's quite enlightening. But in my view, Africa needs to create that way of thinking at the very early stage, okay? get our kids to start imagining what it will be like. And if it's going to be like that, what can I do to help it get there? Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to take, uh, move it to Lutz, because you 
because it, it dovetails nicely into stuff that you think about as well, which is uh, whether the, the skills are there, whether African companies can drive uh, innovation if they don't have the skill, the skill sets, and, and how you fix that, solve that problem. Yeah. Steve, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more with you. The human capital is probably the decipher of, um, part of the equation. Here's an interesting observation. Youth unemployment, as far as I'm concerned, is too high in every single African country that That's I'm aware true. of. At the same time, if you turn around and you talk to Microsoft customers or partners, thousands of them are across the continent, and guarantee you within five minutes, the first message that you hear is, we cannot find the talent that we need right now to grow our business. How can that be? We have a couple of programs where we're trying to solve it. We have a program called Internship for Africa, focusing more on sales and marketing. We have one called the For Africa App Factory, focusing on developer skills. Every single participant, by now I think we crossed the 1,000 participant line, every single participant has a college degree. And yet they come to an internship, typically unpaid internship program, because they cannot find a job. Once they go through the program, typically six months, our employability rate currently is 85% and higher. So what, what's going on? It's actually relatively straightforward. Our education systems not only necessarily teach the right content, although they're catching up, they're not teaching in it the right way. And those two actually have to come together. So one thing that we are trying to do in our For Africa initiative, one of the pillars, the two other ones is innovation and affordable access. The third pillar that I have the pleasure of running is called world-class skills. And although it has been said here before, the overall education systems in Africa are catching up, which is good news. What doesn't happen is necessarily to catch up with the right things. The other thing that you have to bear in mind, there are millions of young people that have completed school. They have even a bigger problem because there's no institution responsible from there for them any longer to kind of connect with them. So we are trying to, we have a, a program called the Microsoft Virtual Academy, an online academy. So we're trying to provide um, services for young Africans that are not in school anymore. Yeah. Let me add one more thing that is really close to our heart. Because as much as we're looking at the, um, the startups, the entrepreneurship, creating new jobs, we have to be really focused on the job that could get lost again. The digital transformation is a disruption not only for new companies creating opportunity, it's a massive disruption for existing companies. We have hundreds and hundreds of, of partners and thousands of customers around the continent. We're spending a lot of time to help them understand what the digital transformation means, that it's not coming sometime in the future, but it's here, how to prepare for it and translate it into a business opportunity. So it's really those three layers when you talk about talent yeah. that we have to worry about. The ones that are still at school, the ones that already have graduated and are stuck in between, and then the third ones are actually the people that have a job today but are in a position where that might not be the case in a sheer one or two years from now, and they deserve our attention and programs as well. Yeah, no, that's, it's fantastic stuff, and it's interesting that uh, I don't think Microsoft is alone in, in thinking this way, but you know, Google and uh, some of the other big companies, uh, SAP and some others, are also thinking about providing skills beyond just college degrees and, and, and fin school finishing uh, uh, certificates. Um, I wanted to uh, come to Aminata to just talk a little bit about, a bit more about how you integrate uh, various sectors in the digital economy because it, it's not just about, as we've said, several, all the speakers perhaps have, have pointed out that it's, you know, it's not just about technology for technology's sake, it's about everything from agriculture to finance to uh, retail, how do we, uh, to healthcare, how do we integrate uh, these various sectors of the economy? Um, yeah, so uh, indeed it's not only about the technology. The technology matters. Uh, we need to actually master the technology. We need to know how to use the technology. And uh, uh, this must be done to capacity building. So education is important. We know that in Africa, uh, there is a high illiteracy rate. And if we look at digital literacy, the, the rate is even lower. So there is a need to have education and capacity building in different sectors, but also in ICT, so that people know how to use the technology. So it definitely matters. But uh, we have to go beyond the technology and then say, how do we use this technology? Uh, and then apply it to the applications which can make a difference in people's lives. Uh, and this is really context, uh, 
uh, we have to have the context awareness. So um, I, I wanted maybe to come here and say, if we look at in uh, entrepreneurship, we're talking about business, a lot of small businesses in Africa are held by women. Uh, so you have a lot of women with very small businesses, and uh, they don't. Most of them are not educated. So what we want here is how can we make sure, for example, that all these businesses and they are in different sectors. Some of them are selling, uh, but they need to know how to use the ICT in in order to increase uh, the businesses they are doing in order to uh, improve what they are doing. So again, it brings me back to capacity building. So when I, I see the integration of ICT and the other sector is how can, how do we, do we know how to use that technology? So we need to have policies which are in place and teach people also how to use the technology. Once we have the capacity to use the technology, then integrating it in what we do every day mm -hmm. is something which will be easy. So for me, again, it comes back to education yeah. and then to the policies, and the policies is a policy which makes it affordable to people because even if I know how to use the technology, if I cannot afford to have internet access, well, I won't have it in my business. So the policies here will come in place in order to uh, give access to the people to have uh, the technology and then to use it. And even if I, we have the infrastructure, if people still cannot afford it, yeah. they won't use it. So infrastructure technology is matter, but how can you use, we spread it to or everybody uh, comes to policies and education. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's completely, on, completely on point because um, you know, no matter what country you go to, and it obviously varies to the degrees, but you know, uh, anywhere between 40 to 70 percent, probably higher, uh, as, a, as a share of GDP is, is in the informal economy. Um, and, you know, this means a lot of African countries are not getting the taxes they could be getting and, and raising more revenue. And uh, a digitized economy encourages that, enables that, because everything is going through uh, uh, some form of record uh, that governments can, uh, can reference. Um, I think we should probably open up to uh, questions because we go about 15 minutes left. Do we have any questions? Lady here. We have mic microphones for, the, there's a lady here. Right there. Hello, thank you very much um, for all the insights that you've shared. The question that I have is, um, as um, great as this forum is, there's, um, someone had mentioned something about policies. I think um, two people actually, and I think that's really important. So is there, my question is really, is there a space at um, the NEF um, this year where all the ministers of science and technology, um, for instance, um, are going to um, meet with, you know, um, people from the science, um, ICT, you know, the digital space, because I see a lot of disconnect. Um, we're talking about all these great innovations, what um, scientists, young scientists are doing. Um, for instance, I'm from Nigeria. We still have to go back to speak with people in government that are not even aware a lot of times of the things, the critical roles that they play. So the disconnect is still there because there's only so much that the private sector can do. That's my question, thank you. Do you have, okay. I, I don't know if there is a forum, but I have a comment on this. So because I've heard even in the morning some comments about, you know, government and policymakers uh, doing their part, right? But I actually look at it from the different, a different perspective, which is, perhaps some of our scientists should actually think about being embedded in government, right? They should be, instead of you know, having a once or twice a year meeting with the minister, it does make sense for scientists to be actually going in and working with them in working various formats. Yeah, absolutely. I know, for example, the American Academy of Science does encourage such type of programs. I don't know if the African Academy of Science does it, but I believe that those type of engagements are probably the most effective way of uh, influencing policy. Let me, can I yes, sure. quickly, um, to add as well, as I don't believe it's a one event. 
I think it's an ongoing engagement, and I do also believe that, that uh, private companies uh, have a role to play. Let me give you two examples. We opened six months ago the Policy Innovation Center together with Stratmore University in Nairobi. In fact, that's where I was last week. And what we're now doing there is we're bringing academia as well as government representatives and industry together to have the necessary discussions on an ongoing basis. By the way, last week was a fascinating discussion about the role of the European GDPR um, uh, regulation, which will be effective in May, on the African continent. So that's a typical scenario there. The other example is, and I think in one of the earlier uh, panels, the discussion was asked about IP protection oh, for yeah, Africa, exactly. right? Super important topic. Very Again, we can't solve it as Microsoft, but we can do things. What we've done is, as the For Africa initiative, we created an IP hub where it's super easy to register your IP, you get advice on how to uh, protect it, you name it. In itself, it doesn't solve it. And then we turned around and donated that hub to Comessa, which is an organization that we regularly work with as well. So there, those, we, there are more, but those are two examples where industry can come and contribute to what I believe has to be an ongoing discussion. Great. Another question there. And yeah, just to, can I, this is someone over here. Yeah, just to uh, touch on that as well before the question, uh, in my role as editor at Quartz Africa, you know, when I started for the first six months, uh, as I would go through stories and people would pitch stories to me, particularly if it was about technology and innovation, the thing that kept on coming up was the role of regulators in, Af in African countries. Um, it was a mix of exactly what the, the lady said, which is, the people in the government just had no idea, yeah. right? They, they just were scared. It's, you know, this is what, we could only read yeah. it as scared because they would just block things without any kind of logic or, or uh, understanding. Uh, and, and there's always this, this, this story about uh, the success of M-Pesa uh, in, in Kenya. And, and someone once said to me that one of the reasons it succeeded was because the government didn't, really didn't know much about it. And they kind of just left them to get on with it. <laughs> Did you want to uh, touch on that? Yeah, I, if I may just make a comment about, uh, the, I think, the previous question, which just to say, well, for a start, at Rwanda, we're not scared of technology as a government. Um, but the, gov the government of Rwanda, <laughs> the government of Rwanda has, um, has set up two important organizations in this country that, that try to to link policy, or at least to create a link between the private sector and government so that policy can be informed from both sides. Uh, at the top level is the Council for, uh, National Council for Science and Technology, which brings together, literally, it's the peak body for scientists, for, for scientists and technologists in this country. Right. But from the perspective of, of governance and and policy making, okay? Another body that was uh, established recently is called the Rwanda uh, Information Society Authority, which once again uh, has very much a private sector uh, jacket uh, because they came from Rwanda Development Board recently. <clears throat> Sorry, I had to say that. <laughs> um, so that those two organizations, uh, RISA, which is the Rwanda Information Society Authority, is much closer to the private sector. It's, it, it literally That's interesting. has to be. It has no choice. So, so, so you have better working, understanding yeah, of the At the working challenges. level, at the implementation yeah. level, that's government's link to the private sector, okay. as well as the Rwanda Development Board. Okay. But at the peak level is the National Council for Science and Technology, which I believe at least a combination of the two should maintain that balance between policy that is ill-informed, or rather remove the possibility of policy that is ill-informed because of poor contact with the private sector. Okay. We've, kept the lady, we've kept the lady waiting with the microphone. Sorry, okay. Sorry about that. Go on. Thank you. I also enjoyed the discussion. I'm Dr. Solange Wituze from the Regional Universities Forum, but also from the Rwanda Academy of Science. My question goes to either one of you, but the gentleman from uh, Microsoft and IBM. And it has to do with, when you say you're going to, to look for like a professional skill development, 
why don't you try to work with universities to kind of make those students ready, what we call like a plug and play, rather than creating parallel structures that actually are going to make some of our graduates still kind of industry relevant. And so is there, a, to cut a long, a long question short, is there a possibility for industries like IBM or Microsoft or the likes to actually proactively work with the universities, even at the TVET level, to actually help the student to come out ready to plug and play, rather than creating parallel structures. Thank you. Actually, I couldn't agree more. Internally, I often say is the programs that we run should not exist once we have that done. So the invitation goes back to you, bring us in. And I know that IBM has a similar position. I could rattle down now at least a dozen different programs that we have that actually are meant for schools and universities. In fact, I would like to thank Rhonda being, having the foresight, there's a lot of things that we do together uh, in schools in Rwanda to bring technology into schools. But ultimately, and, and the um, for Africa App Factory that I mentioned, is running at three or four universities. We just announced another one at USIU in Kenya. So if you're representing a particular institution, please talk, talk to us. But ultimately, you are, you are right. We have to do the handshake. And I know that, that companies like IBM or us are extremely willing to bring what we know and how to do it into universities or schools. In the meantime, we're running programs in, uh, on the side because A, the hiring needs are, are really pressing. And the other thing is, the young people that have left school, they can't benefit from anything anymore that we are doing to schools and graduates that are currently enrolled. Yeah, I mean, we work hand in hand with the universities, right? I think you have addressed uh, the question very well. Uh, another thing that uh, I would add is, you know, for example, from R&D perspective, we actually define, you know, the research que questions based on local context together with professors and students and we work on them together. So we create intellectual property together, we deploy assets together, and we use that type of collaboration to actually you know, train skills so that you know, those students, you know, as they finish their either bachelor's, master's, or PhD, some of them will come to us, but we're also very happy for some to go into government and for some to go to uh, you know, Microsoft. Actually, some of them end up going to some of the best universities in the world. But you have to work hand in hand, and that has always been our approach. Other questions? I, if I may add a, a comment on that one, please. OK. Um, yes, we do appreciate uh, the effort, especially from IBM and Microsoft. But let me just give you a bigger picture that we're trying to create so that all technology companies can, can have that, that close contact with both academia and uh, research uh, centers of excellence. <clears throat> it's under the program you see outside called Kigali Innovation City, which <clears throat> described in a physical sense is a place. It's only 60 hectares, but where, where we'll be relocating universities there, starting with Carnegie Mellon, African Institute for Mathematical Sciences, and all the others I mentioned before, and part of the University of Rwanda, into a space that small. And most of our technology companies will be housed there as well. Why? Because we want those companies, those tech companies, and the universities to live together, work together, and implement a whole new concept called continuous internship. Because that's how, that's the kind of marriage we want between industry and our academic institutions. Or, uh, research institutions like the ones I just mentioned. So that's, that, that, that's a, a, an important concept in this model we call Kigali Innovation City, to bring right. research from the uh, learning institutions and product development in technology companies into one place. So I, I'm sure yeah, that IBM, Microsoft, you'll be part of it, because it, it makes it so much simpler. Thank you, thank you. Uh, there's a lady there in white. <laughs> it's a good thing you're wearing white, I can see you from here. I know, right? <laughs> I tried my best. So my name is Absa, I'm from Senegal. I am the marketing uh, leader for Middle East Africa and Turkey for IBM. 
Uh, but I'm not here for IBM on behalf of IBM. I'm here on behalf of my association, which is called Jitter. So I'll first start with, an, with a suggestion, and I would invite the panelists to let us know what they think about it. So first of all, what I do is that with my association, which is called Jitter, we did think of a platform which is concrete since we talk about digital and that we need case studies made from, you know, made in Africa. So that platform is called Techie and is able to use Watson technology, which is an artificial intelligence, and is able to help any child willing to know about their personality what type of carrier could fit them better based on MBTI. So now my suggestion or my question is how do you believe such kind of initiative should be protected and nurtured among the continent, across the countries in this continent? Because as I've been awarded at IBM with the Mia Wilder Awards for that ingenious idea, I feel like it would gain more impact if we could use it either in Rwanda or Senegal, but at a wider level. So how do you think that we as, I'm not a researcher, right? I'm an entrepreneur. But how do you think that we can leverage such type of initiative across other countries uh, in Africa? And the second question is a bit related to what um, you were saying to earlier is, how can we leverage initiative like M-Pesa not to um, benefit countries abroad, but to benefit Africa first? Because at the end of the day, if an idea is ingenious enough to be created in this continent, we should be able to protect it as well and implement it in other countries across this continent. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, well, if I, if I may just answer the last part of your question, I think good ideas like that where you've developed something that is so useful for the whole, for the whole continent and probably for the whole world, uh, we believe that you need a, a period of time where you can do a proof of concept as to how you take it to market. Now, we welcome any such ideas here, and I know you'd be welcomed elsewhere. It's just that here, if you, if you, if you were to do it here, you would be doing it with uh, Pan-African talent from all the countries in Africa, most of the countries in Africa, at least 27 of them. Um, that proof of concept then gives you the confidence as to how you can take it to the rest of the continent. I think, I think one of the gaps that we see in Africa specifically, and when you compare it to what's happening in Singapore, what's happening in Silicon Valley, is there's a gap in mentorship especially when people have ideas. Uh, to give you an idea, we, we run an Africa Innovation Challenge in 10 countries about a year and a half ago. We received 500 ideas from 43 different countries. And when we looked at every idea, there was just so much potential. And a lot of times what happens is they have great ideas. The reason Silicon Valley works is not because people gave them money, but the mentorship that comes on how to build a company, how to experiment, how to do design thinking, how to make all the solutions to be very human-centric. For me, I think those are the kinds of things. A lot of times we tend to focus on what university education is needed, right. but the, soft, the technical skills coupled with the soft skills that you need to learn to design things that are human-centric, to design things that are uh, addressable in terms of some of the gaps that you see, but providing the mentorship, also how do you scale these things once you, pro you pass that proof of concept there's a little bit of a gap that I think uh, industry and other, uh, especially as you talked, Rwanda has been a perfect example where bringing the tech companies together and then being able to provide the mentorship, not only among each other, but also providing external mentorship becomes a very big part of it. Otherwise, it's almost impossible to build a startup. Uh, let's see, you okay. have the last um, word. <laughs> Well, first of all, congratulations for what you have done. I think uh, we should encourage a lot of uh, innovation from Africa. Mm. Uh, so this is very important. I just wanted to point out, I came across Africa Innovation Competition lately, uh, which is a competition uh, trying to get good ideas from African innovators and then mentoring them. As you said, mentoring is very important. So they will actually mentor those uh, innovators to put the ideas forward and to try to develop them. So I will, I will actually recommend you maybe to check what they are doing and to check other platforms also. Uh, that's my last word, congratulations. Okay, looks like we've run out of time. Um, 
The, uh, my key takeaway, I have several key words here, but the, the one that uh, sticks with me um, that I think kind of captures the, uh, a lot of what we touched on in this, in this uh, panel was something Steve said, which is innovation requires talent. Uh, the, the human capital issue, um, you know, we, when you see the, the title of the panel is digital economy, it sounds like we're just going to be talking about big numbers and all that kind of stuff, but actually it's really about people, about investing in, in, in Africans, presumably they'll mainly be young Africans because our continent is very young, um, and, the, and that, that way we get the full potential of uh, what a digital economy is and can be and uh, will transform this continent. Um, thank you very much to my excellent panel and thank you all for attending.